Right, Good to see you again. Here, because, uh, <laughs> it's my great pleasure to introduce um, Philip Beasley to you. Um, he's a practicing um, visual artist, architect, and professor in the architecture at the University of Waterloo. He's also professor of digital design and architecture and urbanism at the European Graduate School. And he is the director for the Living Architecture Systems Group that collaborates extensively very interdisciplinary and very internationally. So he has a team of like um, 40 teams themselves, I think. Um, he incorporates methods such as industrial design, digital prototyping, and mechanotronics engineering. And I think we have all these groups presented here, plus some others. And I'm really glad to see that a very interdisciplinary audience here as well. Um, sentient architecture ultimately combines the craft of lightweight textile structures dense arrays of distributed computer controls, um, together with machine learning and artificial life chemistry. Um, these structures, if you encounter them uh, somewhere in different art galleries or shopping centers sometimes, um, they breathe, they are reactive. It's a very, very essential experience actually to encounter them. Instead of valuing resistance and closure, which the water drop does, probably see the shape of a water drop in front of you now, they maximize interaction like a snowflake. And they exploit curiosity-driven machine learning. They foreshadow future intelligent environments and the emerging Internet of Things. And there's an urgent need, I believe, to understand how these embedded technologies affect the experience of individuals that inhabit these spaces, such as us, and how these technologies can be most appropriately used to improve um, how we feel, how we live our lives. And um, in new uh, collaboration uh, with um, researchers here at IU, is now trying to visualize these sensory actuator systems and how these sensors then uh, take in information from their surroundings, from other interactions with human beings, and how these um, sensors and um, sensory inputs are processed by artificial intelligence control circuits and then used to control diverse sen uh, actuators. And ideally, anyone today and tomorrow can understand these new Internet of Things environments and get them empowered to not only live with them, but also to mastermind them and to make them most useful for all of us. And um, it's a great pleasure to um, have Philip show, share this work with you. And I would like to mention that this was only possible because of uh, generous funding by the data science uh, program, which we now have in our school, by intelligent systems engineering, which we now also have in our school of informatics and computing, and by CNS. So thank you, and uh, please welcome to me. Thank you so much. <laughs> Eddie, is it possible to, to close the blinds a little bit more? Okay. Thank you so much. And in addition to that, that very, very generous introduction, Katia, I, I must say that I'm, I'm very happy to be here with you. Um, I've been having a dialogue through Katty with the community for several months. But being here is so very striking amidst the formation of two new schools and drawing on a deep, deep history it does seem like there's such incredibly valuable work to do together. I'm going to speak for about 50 minutes and I'll, I'll try to ask some fundamental questions about some possibilities of architecture. And I, Would it be okay just to close the blinds at, at the back as well, just, just so that this, this uh, shows up a little bit more? And the kinds of questions I'm going to ask are those that relate to trying to make a contribution. Questions like, is it possible to approach renewal and to create fertility? To create an environment that might think and speak and have its own feelings, that might approach the qualities of life? And I hope that I can justify some of those questions by sharing some very particular craft. If I was standing, and is it okay if I, if I turn off a couple of those lights as well? Sorry, just forgive me for tinkering. 
There, that's better, yeah. If I was standing on the ground, the solid ground, perhaps the ground of my parents, or the nature of preceding generations, then I think that as an architect and as a maker, I would have an absolutely wonderful kind of task. I mean, being able to, set, to have the sense that the world is solid and that nature is with us and that we are held and that life will always wrap around us and heal us and enfold us and allowing us to form a set of responses as designers and makers and engineers against the kind of cardinal powers of the world. And architecture, when it has that sense of solidity underfoot, has a kind of a beautiful, almost delicious task of projecting against that tremendous power, perhaps of wrapping out the most sensitive filters, but knowing ultimately that the ground is there, is eternal. When I say that, I'm, I'm reciting some paradigms. Vitruvius, the Roman theorist 2,000 years ago, spoke of firmitas, permanence, as the absolute paramount fa fundament of architecture. And what of the ground that I stand on today? It's difficult to speak of a future. It might be possible to be optimistic. But with effort. And the sense of the trembling ground. This kind of almost unspeakable uncertainty of what our fundament is, raises fundamental questions about how to respond as an architect or a maker or an activist. I think that it would be very understandable if a conscientious young architect today responded to such a sense and tried to wrap the tightest possible jacket around what they did, the kind of no trace camping or radical minimum material consumption that might be associated with the sustainability movement, an absolutely essential kind of mission for us to learn. And yet, at the same time, the kind of encapsulation that's involved in that pursuit, beyond the incremental percentages of improvement and optimization of material use, surely does not change fundamentally the way we live. Only limits, only holds, carefully, but renders static. And so I must say I hope for a very different kind of work. Knowing those limits and learning them, learning to be responsible, but somehow creating a fertility bubbles out, that effloresces, that creates resource positivity, that creates renewal. And I realize that in saying these kinds of things that I'm, I'm making some perhaps claims that need to be justified. And so I hope that I can offer some particular crafts that might allow us to see some particular strategies that might be a contribution. The kind of work I do is quite light work. It involves multiple collaborations with multiple disciplines, and it involves making extremely lightweight scaffolds that then are shot through with computational systems, lightweight control systems, highly distributed chemistries as well, a kind of prototypical metabolism that runs through this future architecture. And then that's scripted to have responses as well and now has some, some machine learning in it as well. And it's founded on intimacy and touch, the kind of exchange that's highly, highly tactile. Some of the work reaches out and involves kinetic responses as well. Not high, strong kinetic responses of a tool, but rather creating a kind of mutual exchange, an ambience, breathing, and gentle kinds of responses. And that's founded on intimacy and touch and building out from increments. Oops. 
How do I get that out? Some of the work also expands into couture, into the sense of creating expanded physiology for ourselves as well. This is a lovely, lovely collaboration with, with Iris Van Herpen in, in Amsterdam. And some of it involves building quite resilient scaffolds out of multiple geometries and then finding ways to, 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 to route cabling through it and communication in order to make a fundamental kind of building material, which then is deeply layered here in, 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 uh, in, in this installation, Epiphyte Chamber in Korea. You can see some of the layers here with, where chemical systems, uh, the, 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 the blue of, of a copper sulfate sol solution make, making, vine making uh, organic batteries, for example, and gr grotto-like oil-filled uh, vesicles above can be seen as a kind of a strata. And backing out from, from that, that kind of work, you can start to see the scale that I hope you can start to see as a kind of public architecture, not a strong public architecture, not a parade, not a great public square, but rather the kind of grove in which individuals might cluster and gather and build small communities that might start to, to, to speak of a kind of resilience. And backing out again, some of this work also projects with very ephemeral clouds, far beyond our, bo our boundaries, far beyond a kind of social sphere, into the kind of dimensions that might speak of weather and rather flickering, gentle phenomena at the very edges of our perception as well, a kind of a shadow play, that, one, one that speaks with limits. Some of the work is quite optimistic, such as the kind of symphonic arrays that you see here in, in the Venice Pavilion, the, uh, the Canadian Pavilion in, in Venice a, a few, few years ago, where there are layers of hyperbolic scaffolds and basket-like columns and then groves of hovering filters that are orchestrated in a certain kind of symphonic har harmony, a, ra a rather chorus-like -like env environment that folds around you. And these, again, are founded in quite intimate clusters of very, very lightweight material, which then track your own movements and result in rippling out and cascades of very gentle tremors that reach far beyond you and show your traces and start a conversation. In some of the work, it can be deeply, deeply interwoven with multiple cascades of movement as well in conversation. And some of the work, again, can start to move quite far out of control, such as this noise-like, storm-like behavior that you can see cascading through this environment in, in Sydney. The sensors are, 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 uh, are, are set quite high in, 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 in this particular environment, and that results in all kinds of interference and a, a kind of a, a stuttering That kind of, of interactive system then is folded together and orchestrated sometimes in emotional systems as well. In this little bamboo field that you're seeing here, there were gestures that were tracked and if you moved very slowly, then the system would respond and interpret to you as kind and would calm down and settle. And if you moved very quickly, it would interpret you as hostile and it would get nervous and it would clutch and convulse. And so each of those, those motions would then ripple all the way across the, across the environment, being alternately gentle and quite happy, or else incredibly nervous. And you know, the fools that we were, we thought that would be pretty great, but, it, but in, instead, because of the ambiguity between those things, we simply created something that was mentally ill. I'm sorry. So what I'm going to try to do is share some comments first that speak about relationships with the world and, and some sort of fundamental kind of relationships, the, the kinds that I was sharing uh, when we just began, when I was speaking about standing on the solid ground. And then I'll try to share a series of technical crafts, ways that might, might be available 
ways that have been developed for, for generating some responses. And I'll try to turn that into an argument for a particular way of working with design. I'll, I'll use words like dissipative design or force shedding design as offering a kind of resi resilience. And I'm going to try and talk about a renewal of the, of the, of the idea of entropy as well, trying to, trying to, trying to renew that, that, that idea and, and changing it from, from, this, from the sense of, of loss and, de and decay. I'll talk about a couple of projects. I'll, I'll, sh I'll show, show some, some more collaborations with Iris Van Herpen for investment, and I'll try to ca talk about a couple of, of, of projects um, of, of architectural scale as well. And then I'll, I'll conclude with a very brief look at, at the machine learning and curiosity systems that we're working on right now. When I speak about the relationships here, I'm drawing on a particular kind of form language. The idea that we might make responses and that we might shape elements and that we might build worlds. And I'm very struck by the way I have been taught. I wonder whether you can relate to this yourself in your own cultural upbringings. Taught to see things as being very particular. The way I've been taught to make architecture is one that says that things need to be clear and bounded and strong and unified. And also to be very, very mindful of materials and so therefore a thoughtful kind of designer which would say that an envelope of a building is expensive and so therefore it needs to be as tight as possible and as limited as possible. And the kind of paradigms that might say that this raindrop is almost the epitome, the perfect way one could make something. As if it's an origin of the universe, as if this is a destination for making. I want to offer a rather different idea, and Caddy mentioned it, the idea that even though this speaks, as Plato spoke, of the origin of the world as something beautiful and reductive, that we could see it as, as, as being embodied in a single point or a sphere, there's also something tremendously ugly about this thing. Can you go with me and see it as horrible and ugly? You're not convinced at all. Why I hate it? I think I do actually hate it. I, I hate it because this speaks of a particular equation in which there's the maximum possible interior territory and the minimum possible exposure to the world around it. I mean, the arithmetic of it absolutely epitomizes that. And so that makes it a machine for resisting interaction with the world. Now that's a form language that's excellent for ballistics or for real estate maximizing territory, and it's an excellent thing if you're trying to retain as absolutely much heat as possible in order to avoid shedding it. But it's the worst possible language if you're trying to cool down, for example, or, or if you are rendered lively by having interaction with others, because there can't be any, anything less, le less interactive than a sphere. And so I do want to speak about the possibility of an alternative I mean, using the kind of paradigm, Katie mentioned it, Katie mentioned it alre already in a snowflake, the kind of form language that would say that for the same amount of material, the maximum possible reticulation, the greatest possible vulnerability and, and, re and reaction with, with the surroundings might, might be sought. And it's very strange to me that such a form language might be thought of as somehow frilly or excessive or weak deeply gendered. I want to make an argument, at least, that the kind of maximum reticulation and efflorescence might offer a tremendously valuable way of making things, a deliberate kind of vulnerability, a beautiful kind of efflorescence. So to comment on, on just a few crafts that might support this, I love the kind of emergence of complex systems thinking that allows us to understand that things are deeply interconnected. Here's a model of an example. It's this sort of delicious term, quasi-geostrophic turbulence. Quasi meaning undulating and almost hiccuping, 
geostrophic, meaning the turning of the surface of the world. And this kind of condition in which things upwell and then cease and arise and fall, but at any given point, this kind of remarkable kind of peaceful precariousness occurs when very special balance is happening. In this case, between the balance of the Coriolis effect, the spinning of the world, and planetary gravity. And when those are precariously balanced, then the energy exchanges allow the gentlest of kind of movement and create a kind of pluripotency in which things might arise at any given point with the tiniest, tiniest perturbations and bifur bifurcations. Ilya Prigogine spoke about this 50 years ago and spoke about butterflies creating hurricanes. This kind of lovely sense that if you create things in exquisite balance, then you can create tremendous possibility. Here are just a couple of models of, of, of the same thing happening. This, 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 this is this kind of lovely for, force shedding that, that can happen when, when things are so very precariously balanced. And here, here's, an, here's another example. This is on Paraview. It's open source software, so, so, so any, anyone can, can model this, this themselves. The dark spots are um, vorticity potential, me, mean, meaning that they, they have the greatest propensity for, for gathering in forces and, and, and then, then turning and, and, ex, and accelerating. This kind of language seems to be extremely valuable. Another language might be, I think, the sense of the curious granular accretion that we might see in single cell and, and multiple cell li living forms and the kind of dynamics especially that might occur at the edges of these things. I mean, when, when I was a young science student, I wonder whether, whether you were similar, I would have concentrated on the edges of these things. You know, I, I, I would have labeled the, the outer voids and I would have been proud about knowing, knowing, knowing neat words like, like the organelles and the mitochondria, etc. Et in, inside. But I would have imparted a kind of an agency, to this, an agency to this kind of thing, which would say, it is a being and it is hunting and it's pushing. And the outside, I f I'm pretty sure, would have been conceptualized as a void, as simply the space for action. And yet, I'm tremendously interested in understanding that, in fact, that boundary is a deep chemical gradient in, in which concentration, concentrations on the outside quite literally pull os osmotically material through and set up an exchange. And so rather than this thing sort of freely hunting in a void, we could equally say that the surrounding environment is pulling it in into its world an absolutely coupled kind of mutual sense, which utterly changes the, 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 the sense of agency, as if the surrounding is printing its action in, into itself, at, at least as a mutual coupling. And that sense, I think, creates a very renewed idea of participating. The thoughts that I'm sharing are fundamentally ones which refer to a, an attempt to understand how forces in the, in the world play. And they're so very influenced by a traditional understanding of what entropy might be. I mean, the idea in the second law of thermodynamics that things fall apart and that the universe inexorably pers pursues entropy. Entropy that traditionally might be understood as disorder. It's kind of incredibly forlorn sense of things starting as crystalline, perfect things, and then our inexorable lot being one of dust, of decay, of always falling apart. And what a curious kind of relationship with the world that sets up for humanity, because it means that, inst that the world needs somehow to be resisted, that somehow we're fighting this, this kind of nat natural force, that what we are trying to do as, as living things is push against it in an absolute countering kind of motion, trying to make closed, strong, firm things. And it also suggests that somehow the world is a disappointment. The idea that things will fall, that the material world 
is somehow a loss. I mean, these things are so embedded in our cultural values, at least in in, in Western world, that it sets up a very peculiar way, to my mind, of working. And it's tr so very striking to see some renewed conceptions of the way the world can work. Prigogine, who I've just quoted, introduced dissipative forms, perhaps 50 or 60 years ago, introducing the idea that instead of just working from purity into disorder, there's an absolutely tenacious, prevailing kind of intermediate form, granular forms. Thinking, for example, of the ripples of sand on a beach that stand tenaciously, abso absolutely kind of competently, arguably permanently, the ripples of sand in a, in a, in a desert, like, li likewise, standing waves. And that that whole form language, in fact, is a kind of a resolution of the, f of the flux of a driven system, of the kind of rain of energy under the sun, or the, or the, the spinning, or the planetary gravities that, that we're under. And that that produces an entirely different sense than the kinds of, of conceptions that say that matter flows from purity to decay. Instead, this intermediate dissipative form language starts to offer an absolutely viable sense that things can be alive, that things can last. And in fact, Jeremy England, the, the new physicist at MIT, is speaking the, the most tremendously interesting interpretations of, of entropy, in which he says that living things actually epitomize the generation of, of, of entropy, and, and therefore they are, are dynamically ad adapted for dissipation, and, and therefore life is somehow pulled out of them and resonantly created and optimized. The, this, this sense then that instead of having to fight the materiality of the world, that living systems are possible and are tenacious, and that interchange with the world and deep, deep involvement with the fluxes of the world can be absolutely a viable source of, fer of fertility. I find this just a tremendously encouraging way of understanding what, what relationships can be, as opposed to imagining that fighting and closure is a necessity. Now, the kind of crafts that, that, I, that, uh, that I, I might, might, might mention include very carefully drawing elements and pulling them out through multiple cycles of refinement into their maximum state of precariousness so that individual, in individual pieces and, and, and materials are drawn out right to the very edges of, of, of their boundaries. This is using multiple cycles of, of, of drawing and digital fabrication. And you can see the same kind of thing happening in these chevrons here, which clip together using snap fit, de fit detailing into, into tetrahedrons. If, if two, two of those snapping together make, make the dual of, duals of a, of a tetrahedron, which then is a, a tremendously efficient space filling system which can be multiplied into, into matrices like you see here, waffles and then hyperbolic scaffolds with, with wonderful resilience and an absolute minimum of, of, of material use with tremendous force. And then again, those can be clothed and, and deeply kind of inhabited by the, by the glands and traps of materials that you see here, carrying salt and, and, and oil and imparting a kind of primary fertility, as, as if this is, this is a kind of a, a turf that is a building material. This kind of system also works by, by trying to renew a geometry rather than the kind of crystalline geometry which is so pervasive in, in cracking and, and in kind of homogeneous order. The attempt to set up quasi-periodic geometries in which elements keep on having shifting vectors that imparts tremendous resiliency. The Penrose tessellation that you see here is an example organizing this, the scaffolds. What you can see is the Penrose tessellation is 10 divisions of a circle and it makes rhombi like this, or like, or like that, or like this, th or like this one. And those are, are simple multiplications of, of the tenth of a circle, 36 or 72 d d d degrees at a time, for example. And these are duels of, of those rhombi, just, just by, by putting an arm right, right at, at, uh, at the bisection of each of those arms. And what that allows us to do is, is instead of the complicated geodesics, 
that a previous generation of of, uh, of lightweight architectures tried to pr tried to pursue, but with all kinds of forlorn jointing. I mean, you you may, you may have seen say do dome works with very complicated, rather fussy joints, notwithstanding their 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 very very lightweight structures. In this case, by using the duals, it may it means that every single arm can simply have a resilient two-way joints. Very very simple. So this kind of architecture is using an exchange in which there's more, more, many, many more pieces, but they can be radically simple, and, and, they, and they simply are based on, on resilience. That then can be clothed with elements that make a turf-like kind of, kind of uh, filtering system, and then it gets multiplied again in, into colonies, which, which then, then make the primary architecture of, of, new, of new environments, such as you can see here. And then those float and they make filters. And the individual elements of those filters are, are, are developed and, and detailed quite carefully. For example, the cutting pattern that you can see in this mylar, this is one individual pore, which releases a curling, which then allows the individual element to work a little bit like a leaky heart valve, locking in one direction, releasing in the other, and then for, therefore imparting a kind of a pumping action, which will happen when this is multiplied by the thousandfold. Rather emotional detailing happens as well, clamping and pulling and, and accumulating, allowing this work to function as something like a geotextile, that is, an engineered cl class of material which accumulates and which can build up its resilience. And then, in, in turn, being, being actuated and, and mechanized with the, with the pumping motions that I was demonstrating here. And in general, trying to be tuned for a trembling kind of resonance in which the maximum am amount of, of vibration is, is generated through, throughout these environments. I thoroughly enjoy the craft of taking something right to the very edge of its performance, generating a trem tremendous amount of reactivity as, as a result. Taking those passive formal design moves they can be spun around liquid chemistry using protocells, prototype cells. And these are very simple metabolisms that are very beginning stages of conceiving of an architecture as having osmotic functions, catalyzed functions, exchanges that start to turn the architecture into a resource positive kind of renewing system. Imagine, for, for example, creating chemical veils that could one day go out of the flask and function a little bit like ivy, renewing the, the, the exteriors of buildings, or functioning as a carbon system in, in which carbon dioxide is taken in and a precipitate is, is, is bound up as a carbon capture system. Those kind of very simple inor inorganic systems that would function as, as, as renewing. And in this case, you can, you can see the fir first elements of, of that, that kind of attempt. Here, here we have a strong LED light stimulating the growth of a protocell and then mo moving gentle filters to temp temper the growth by, by, by passing air, air over it as a pump. And then the, the, these are multiplied many hundreds of times in order to make the hovering filters that I was describing. Here you can see so, some, something of, of, of that, that kind of system in, in which water is pumped in from the Venice Canal, canal in, in, in this case passed through the protocells and then tempered through, through these hanging filter systems. Just to show a little bit more of, of this craft, um, you can see the chemical veils here, and this is a copper sulfate crystal with a potassium ferric cyanide solution around it, which then osmotically pumps and makes this lov lovely kind of veil blooming out, which then creates an utterly sticky mess right, right now. But, it, but so it's inside the flask for a very good reason. Here you can see it outside the, f the flasks where, where, where it, it's making in individual strands in, in the open air as a, as a start to towards the, the, se the self-building system, the, the emergent building skin renewal system that we hope will be possible in the future. And here you can see a, b a bit more of the, of the, of the dynamics of the, of the system now. I'm just surveying very quickly a number of crafts, and I'll, I'll wrap this section and, and, and then show a couple of built projects. But I did want to emphasize one more set of behaviors, which is that of, of curiosity. The kinetic, dis highly distributed systems that I've, I've just been sharing in, 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 in this exposure of craft is rather different than a sensor and actuator system in which 
a building sensor will be there and then something will happen. I mean, this is a very, very familiar sense to us. We walk through the doors of a, of a shopping center and we expect it to open. That kind of dis deterministic scripting is a pleasure for us and we love the way, the way things are amplifying our, our own domains. Curiosity is rather different. In this little, little exercise, you can see that I'm holding my hand quite still. I'll just play it again. And the machine is experimenting with different pulsing, exploring the state space, and then as I hold still, it gradually becomes, be, uh, be, uh, becomes restful and then stops exploring because of having, having learned itself. But then in curiosity, it will try on and search for other behaviors and it'll be rewarded from a change of information. And that can be done by, 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 re by rewarding changes of information and then combining that with occupancy mapping and also with pre-scripted behaviors that then can be cycled back so, so that the behaviors can be, can be readapted. And that means that the machine, machine learning can turn into a constant exploration, a kind of a very playful kind of interaction with you. We're just at the beginning of, of, of working with, with this kind of machine learning. And right now, it's, the curiosity is very disruptive. I mean, it simply tries different things, you know. But we're really very encouraged by, by the kind of behavior that emerges from this. And so we're very keen on, on pursuing it more. Here you can see the in intermesh topologies that are involved in this. Many, many sensors and many, many, and many arrayed microprocessors all speaking together in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a mesh work. And with, with the plasticity of this, this system being that, the, that those relationships themselves can be remapped and, tried and, and, and retried on by the machine itself. So it can re reconfigure itself in, in terms of its relationships. So with that tour through some particular crafts that make this kind of work, I wanted to offer just a few explorations in projects. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk about a fashion collaboration first, and then, then I'll show a couple of, of environments, one in Shanghai and, and one, in, one in Toronto. I'll, I'll show a little bit more on the, on the Venice project, um, which happened five years ago. And I'll end with, with a, a very happy collaboration, the Sentient Chamber at the National Academy of Science, which, which is building very directly on, on the collaboration right now with, with Katty and, and Andy and other, other colleagues here. With Iris van Herpen, the lovely couture designer from, from Amsterdam, we've been trying to conceive of a kind of a possibility sheath around bodies, building on the kind of trembling vulnerability that I was trying to describe earlier. This rather delicious sense that we can harvest vibrations and expand our own domains. Perhaps it has something to do with the kind of energy that as children we had when we roll down a hill and deliberately make ourselves dizzy, pulling in the world around us. In, in, in this, this particular one, these are little acrylic chevrons which are clipped together with silicon joints between so that the entire thing sh shivers and, and shakes and rolls around you. And in this little clip, you can see just the simplest of, 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 of kinds of, resp of responses of the gentle trembling and, and vibrating that, that happens in, 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 in this vestment as it rolls. Just an extremely simple, simple idea for, for, ge for generating a coat. In this more recent one at, at, at Pompidou, in the magnetic, magnetic, magnetic motion collection, individual pieces of high impact acrylic, of impact resistant acrylic, sorry about that, um, are individually thermally expanded. There are slitting patterns that'll, that allow eat each element to work like a meshwork, opposing grid works that then are, 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 are heated and, and stretched, making this great veil, a kind, of, kind, a kind of, of materialized halo. And in a more recent collaboration, Lucid, simple hexagonal tiles are, are multiplied, swelling, uh, and, and, uh, and contracting in order to make, make hyperbolic bubbling. And setting up, because of their tuning with spectral, ex uh, spectral effects as, as well, very je je gentle, kind of, kind of ir iridescent qualities, a kind of a hesitation 
rather curious kind kind of self consciousness that we were try, trying to tune, in which, in which the expansion was not one of power, but rather of reflection. Here you can see in 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 ordinary light some of some of the qualities of that. It's just the the, the, the gentlest of of kind of gl- glittering reflections. With with the, with these flexible links between between the individual elements, in 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 order to make them very very wearable and very comfortable. Some of this work is not very sit downable. Um, we are, however, working on something on things that are pretty comfortable as well, <laughs> not just a, a, a stand stand upable thing. Um, and uh, these are injection molded polyurethane links, which, which then are very comfortable in this corrugated di- diagrid kind of expanded leather sheath that you can see here, uh, and, or in, the, in this leather version, which is, if you look closely, is deeply studded with crystals. So it's a com- combination of a very, very soft kind of expanded skin and this glittering kind of spe- specular ex- experience as, as, you, as you rove over the surface. The kind of vulnerability and play that I'm, I have just been sharing at very intimate scale is one that has a very direct dialogue with larger environments, such as the Sargasso project that was erected in Toronto in, in Calatrava's at- atrium four, four years ago. And this was positioned over a subway station in which a million people came through over the several days that, the, that this work was, was up. And it was very striking to see these clouds and, and veils, which were arranged hovering overhead, but also which came down and made public rooms along the surface of, 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 of the public space, have a tremendous kind of resilience. Mylar and silicon put together with dynamic relaxation, that, 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 that is the, the kind of jointing that a, te- that a text, textile uses, allowing individual pushing and prodding to be quite naturally absorbed into the surface. And the combination of those kind of wily crafts that would make something tough, together with the simple offering of those gestures, a kind of a gentleness brought out some very, very interesting responses in the public. I mean, if we were making a a subway station, we can well imagine the kind of design decisions we would make. We would make probably the hardest vitrified tile and strong, strong concrete and, and, and stripped stainless steel and design it to be absolutely smashed. And it would survive. Of course it would survive. And yet, very curiously, the kind of behaviors that that detailing imp- can impart is kicking and shoving and tremendous amount of buildup of forces. I mean, think, think of the force, for example, of a flash flood in response to the concrete cha- chambers of a, of a big conduit and how much force can build up when, when we have those kinds of design systems present which simply try to resist a very different kind of language might come out of building something as a wetland, as deeply fissured and and buffered resilient systems, which buffer and incorporate energy as opposed to resist it. And that turns into a social system as well, in which a a very, very interesting set set of, of, of emotional responses happening, of touch, and of a gentleness, and, and also a kind of agency in which people stand and gesture, and point, and perhaps tell somebody else, oh, look, you can touch that. It's OK. You know? um, I, I really love the kind of optimism that start, starts to happen when, when this can be understood as architecture. And I don't think that this detailing is simply naive, is simply a matter of, of, of a kind of a, you know, the, the, the kind of excessive work that would only be possible in good times, in peace time, when you have a lot of police protecting it, you know, or perhaps just for the elite. Rather, I think that we can argue that by using very careful craft and, and using some of these, these geometries, that it is possible to set up an entirely different layer that offers a kind of an empathy and a, and a resilience, rather than simply something that, that, w- that would be a, sim- a symbolism of hope. In, in this Shanghai uh, uh, canopy that you can see hanging, hanging here, the work was very deeply embroidered. Many, many individual glass vessels, 
each, each one of them holding a differential of oil. Heavier oil below, lighter oil than, wa than water above, and individual vesicles were implanted in, in, in those oil beds that were allowed to bloom out in precipitates, making the del most delicate pre uh, pre precipitation layers that then are spun around. Now you can see those start to emerge in, in this sh in the sh uh, above the shadow play that this little loop, loop starts with here. And then test tubes with individual high-powered LEDs are ins inserted in those as lights, and then those are all chained together using shift register processing. Shift register processing in, it, it, it involves uh, uh, microprocessors have a high frequency of, of processing, which, which hum humans can't see. And so if you distribute those kind of responses, then, then you can actually access many, many di different actuators and mechanisms, such, such as lights. And, and, and uh, e even with very, very low, low power microprocessing, you can access many, many things at once. And so you can see the kind of rolling of light here, for, for example, gen gently, incrementally rolling through, the, through this scene as being an example of that, of that. Here you can see it rolling above as well. And in addition to the internal behaviors that, that, are, that are happening, then this is responsive to the, to the occupants as well. I'll just just move through this a little bit more quickly, and and show the o the overhead views as well. You can see the individual elements that I was describing before: the glass glass vessels and the, and the embroidery of the scaffold. And then in a minute, as as the, as the loop loop progresses, we'll we'll see an individual set sensor cluster, and then an occupant starting to gesture and 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 how how it will bloom out. Here it comes. But you can also see vin vinegar cells. These these li little vessels filled filled with vinegar with copper and aluminum electrodes, each one of which makes a tiny little bit of current chained together, and serve, serving to make internal triggering throughout this environment as well. And so these individual blooms of 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 of, of reaction happen in concert with the internal in artificial intelligence of the system as well. And so there's a back and forth, a constant rippling back and forth. Here you can see just the, the, a bit more of the embroidery of this scene. I think in, in, in this loop we'll be able to, to, to see in a, in a minute so some of, of, of the, the protocell systems here is, as well, okay, well that's just a, a, a glass vessel um, encased with the LED. Just going to skip a little bit. For the Canadian Pavilion in Venice, the environment was composed of corrugated diagrid basket-like columns, a very, very lightweight structure that set out a grove, a space through which you could walk. And overhead, interspersed with, with those columnar forms, was a hyperbolic waffle, which was then support, su su supporting multiple chains of, 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 uh, of cricket fields. You can see, see some, some of those over, overhead there, which made small chirping, chirp, chirping noises because each one of them had a shape memory alloy a actuator, which, which, which ma made it contract and, vi and vibrate little tiny whispering fields resulting from that. And then lower reaches of the, of the kind of filters that you see here based on, on these individual elements. In this view, which you, which you can see of, of, the, of the partially built pavilion, the individual basket, basket-like columns are arranged like ghosts. And, and, and then, then individual helical chains of shape memory alloy breathing pores are laid, laid around those columns. And then you can just gently see the start of, resp of responses that then start to build and, ma and make, make uh, waffling chains and breathing chains around you. In, in this clip, you can start to see in the darkness some of the individual clusters which start to call and answer and reach back and forth. The kind of experience that you might have had if you were in a deep forest and hear cicadas calling, and then start to call, and start start to to chorus back back and forth, perhaps. And those are echoed by groups of very simpler simple glands ar around them, salt glands for for ex for example, small bladders that are arranged in groups that pull moisture into themselves. 
because of, of, of their, their, their water-loving chem chemistry. Or oil glands, which impart a kind of humidity. Kind of a hovering network, then, of a primary kind of architecture, which passes material through itself and starts to, to, to render a very, very simple kind of breathing and passage. And in the last project I'll, I'll share with you, the sentient chamber in Washington, Quite a bit more robust forces were orchestrated. What you can see here is, sta is stainless steel expanded mesh column, column works that are arranged within the National Academy building as a waffle. Multiple stems are gathered together and then that sets up um, a, a repeating array and then that's rep repeat repeated upwards as well as downwards. Into, into that system, you can see it here or organized just, just from above in this very simple plan, are triangulated systems. And you can see them here more clearly. They, pu they push up and down and up and down. And then there are small compressive struts worked into this system, whereas the main meshwork that you can see here in these expanded acrylic and expanded stainless steel uh, uh, constructions are tensile. Now what that means is that the overall meshwork here is tensile in 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 integrated. It, it's, it, it's a tensegrity structure, meaning that there, that there is far more tensile structure than there is compressive structure. So that's an inversion of the, of the way a, a normal building would work. A normal building, let's say the building we're in, would have stiff com compressive walls that, 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 that would work with gravity, and then there would be a certain amount of tension, perhaps cross stays, or, or mem members that would stop, thing, stop things shifting around. But our, our own bodies are beautiful examples of tensegrity structures where the fascia and the epidermis, as well as our, ten our, our tendons and, and sinew network, are the primary structure into which bones float, making for a very different kind of response. Now, if we require absolute immobility, then of course this kind of structure is not acceptable at all. And yet, if it's possible to say that, that this kind of relationship, a kind of a slightly agile, gently shifting relationship is possible, then a completely different world of structure becomes quite acceptable, to, acceptable for architecture. And in fact, this is the structural system that large buildings, tall, very tall buildings, are built on in any case. The kind of, of damping and pendular mo mo movement of a skyscraper is, is all already an, an example of this kind of sensibility. But it, 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 it offers tremendous advantages because ten, tensile materials can be sometimes one one hundredth the, ma the mass of, of compressive materials. So a radical difference in, in material use is possible. I was pretty proud of the, this entire pavilion weighing 200 pounds. Here you, here you can see it being clothed again with a frond work of, of little clusters which point up and down, deeply clothing the, the, the entire ma main system. Here we're looking, uh, looking up in this, this beautiful image that I'll shout out to Andy with it with his beautiful photography did, did uh, just a few minutes, months ago, and there are, there are salt glands in, in this this upper frond works, and then there are oil glands in the lower in the lower works, and this this sets up a, a, a very gentle kind of quasi breathing osmosis in in the system, and then looking upward, then 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 we can see this branching column work, which then is very deeply clothed with the chemistry system. Um, that you can start to see here, and, and in individual responses such as, such as the, the frond works that, that you see here. So there's a whole bed of, of sensors that track your motion and then set, set, set up rippling chains of, of, of response throughout, making a very, very strong resilient structure that's capable of handling com considerable loading. Here, here you can see individual helical chains of, 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 of the inorganic chemicals that I was describing earlier sh shooting throughout, throughout the environment. And I mentioned the curiosity systems before in the craft, and this is very active in, 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 in this pavilion. Through, throughout it, there are tentacles which can, can move and gesture towards you, and little vib vibrating crickets that, I, that I'm mentioning. Here's, here's an example of one in, 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 in the vase. And then chains of lights, and, and all, all of them move di differentially with, with, with their own actuations, as I was mentioning earlier. Here's another example of, of a double S SMA driven tent tentacle, and you can see it moving rather spastically in, 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 the, in this stu studio environment. Just 
gently feeling out its position, searching and then coming to rest. I think that we could imagine that kind of behavior as very similar to what we would see, say, in a colt, just immediately after it's born, or perhaps in a human baby for the first couple of months, as that this kind of curious kind of r rippling mu muscular al alignments is, are, are, are searched out. Producing, in the end then, this kind of oscillating, rather trembling response. So let me sum up um, by just speaking about the pursuit of this work. Working from static architecture, the kind of firmitas, the kind of stability that I was complaining about, perhaps, or lamenting at the beginning of this talk. The first generation of this work is sort of unapologetically fragile and is developed within the sanctuary of, of stable systems. Happily dependent, the way work within a petri dish is allowed to effloresce delicately, but with the kind of resilience and the kind of understanding of new crafts that are developed in, in, in such a peaceful environment, it becomes possible to move outside the sanctuary and to encounter full forces, wind, ice, the kind of exchanges of, of, the, of the surrounding. And in turn, with that kind of resilience, it becomes possible to offer resource positive architecture, the kind of building of fertile grounds, and, and the crafting of a world that can start to be self-renewing. In turn, those kinds of layers can expand outwards and start to work with subtle exchanges as well. That is, the chemistry of the air, oxygen, renewals. And this produces, perhaps, the sense that the tuning of an environment becomes the architecture rather than the individual gestures and the individual shapes that we might think of when we make things. Now, I'm going to sum up. I've complained about raindrops. And I've tried to argue for a renewed form language based on a kind of a maximum involvement and reactivity that might involve kinds of vulnerability as well. And I've tried to argue that this could offer a kind of form language for new generations of design. And I've tried to talk about a kind of radical immo immersion in the world, working with very particular crafts, such as increments of response and empathetic movement, working with strong scaffolds, but that are based on some subtle geometries, things that can handle resilience and that can handle multiple layers, building up metabolisms as well, and trying to renew the start, perhaps ge gestures towards the start, of a renewed community as well. Not a proud community, not a unified community, but rather clusters of conversations that could offer a kind of resilience, and making contributions certainly in celebrated ways as well. Ways that are sort of unapologetically fragile and making things that are intimate and full of touch. Is it possible to be optimistic? I don't think it's possible to be optimistic. <coughs> I do think, though, that the kinds of crafts and language that are available to us offer a tremendous amount of involvement that justify a tremendous amount of work. And so I hope that that could offer a contribution. Thank you.
renews itself, so it essentially self-contains? It's a really great question, and and you know the the assumption that things need to be stripped and tough in in order to be real is something that I'm suggesting is a preconception. Um, but it still begs the question of the, sky, of the spider webs. Um, nature has developed extraordinary patterns and, and solutions of self-cleaning materials, of configurations that flush and that stay very happily clean. Um, and those, ki those kinds of solutions are absolutely available to us. The, uh, biomimicry is a very, very interesting kind of a, a expanding practice today. And, and so the configuration of, of say, scales in, in, in which the, the, con the convective plumes of air and the, and the, and the, cy the cycles of, mat of material can be understood so that the deposits that, that occur, that occur on, on surfaces can be understood and projected quite precisely are very available. I, I, I showed very notionally, for example, that some, some CFD software, computational fluid dynamics, in, 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 in that, that part that I was showing on, on weather. And I love the sense that this is available to us, even as open source work you know, to, today. Um, so that d designers have an increasingly fluency in understanding the impacts of how things are made. And that means you can tune things. And that, and that, that means that the kind of decay, decay that we might, might associate you know, with, with the concern that you're absolutely validly raising can be very squarely answered and tuned. I mean, this, 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 it's not at all an inevitability that, that, some, that something just spells decay if it has an open form. Instead, things have performance and they work in particular ways and they need to be understood as being coupled with their surroundings. And we project and we visualize and we work in cycles and understand them and, and we produce things that, that, are, that are very ha happily competent in those ways. Now, I mean, examples, I, I guess, in, in material forms would be, say, a mylar, a, po a, po a polyester, um, which, which, which is used here somewhat temporarily, I mean, because we're pursuing biodegradable uh, bi bioplastics. Uh, you know, I, I, we won't pretend that, that an, that an oil-derived de material is, is an ultimate solution, but it does have the kind of characteristics of having been engineered to, as being an equivalent to archival vellum. So it lasts for a thousand years, and it's stable, and, 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 uh, and it can handle a tremendous amount of force, so you can use compressed air on it, bash it around, clean it, scrub it, and, and so, so those kinds of examples of, of being fairly wily in craft and using particular material performance and then using very careful kind of visualizations and analyses make it pretty clear that this kind of resilient force-shedding design, dissipative design above, above all, design organized for shedding energy and interacting as opposed to resisting is an absolutely viable form. So I, I hope that, that that serves as, as, as a kind of an answer, that, that, that the, the principles involved in this work are, are absolutely viable. Now, what I've been sharing with you is, no, is not a near market uh, thing. I mean, these, these aren't, these aren't th 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 this isn't an agenda which says, let's do it tomorrow. Um, but it is, something of an activity that is, let's do it next week, you know, like, like it's, 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 it's certainly not something which is only devoted to a kind of contemplative activity. It's, it's very serious about being, about being applied. It's the, this, these, these kinds of methods are being offered to contemporary architects. Um, and, and I mean, the, 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 the school that I'm a part of is using them and making a lot of progress. Um, and I, I, th I think it's pretty well founded. It's not sufficient. It, need, it needs to be done, of course, in, in combination with, with other kinds of restraint, like being really careful and, and, and being tough. Uh, but it's fundamentally really about understanding your impacts, like seeing that the air is not void. Rather, we are in a fluid. And we're profoundly interconnected, and, and we are we and we are sharing things, and that that sense of interconnection is really fundamental to, to the work. I mean, how do how do you react to that? Does that does that seem seem like a, like a, a set of responses, or or do, do the 
do the doubts remain? What do you think? So I'm a chemistry professor. We grew up with a mom who was a licensed home builder, so I read Builder Magazine and Architectural Digest since like elementary school. And so I keep thinking, okay, why did, when we bought a woodland, why didn't we just pitch a tent? My husband and I hired an architect to build a house. Well, it's because keeping away the pollution, the noise, the, the weather, you know, we have to worry about tornadoes. And I keep trying to think, like, okay, if we had a super flexible structure like a tent, would we feel safe sleeping in it during a tornado warning? No. <laughs> the answer is clearly no. Um, yep. But at, at the same time, so I'm trying to translate that into a structure that you could actually live in as opposed mm -hmm. to a, a work of art. Because clearly you presented as a beautiful work of art. And the idea of flexible structures is also used in bridge mm -hmm. design, for example. I well, I, no, I mean, I... I what kind of materials as a chemist would we need? Because mylar and all these organic materials with light shining on them, they're great for archival materials. That's right. They're not away, but the sunshine, they're gone in 30 years. The, the, of, of, of course, there, I mean, there, there are some, some of the materials that are being used here that, that, are, that are extremely competent for external use and, and others that are not. They, they, take, they take shelter. Um, somewhat unapologetically. I mean, like, like as, as an experimental space in order to, to learn some quite fresh languages and then, bi and then build up a kind of competency that then, then equips it with, 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 with the ability to, to, to do much more robust things. And th that's, that's a very interesting ki kind of, uh, of practice that, that is of bil building in multiple layers and, ge and generating the way, the way things can work. But I guess I, the, the vulnerability of a tent is a very, very interesting question because if we use, for, for example, deeply in, interwoven membrane that can handle the forces of an ocean, let's say, or a, a tornado, and, it, and if, if we use carefully and engineered uh, fle flexible struts in the, in the design of that tent, and if and if if we were to use some form language, say the way a daffodil will twist in a wind and give and give way and then spring back, you know, designing something for 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 anticipating life in moving fluids, as the as the as the the biologist Stephen Stephen Vogel beautifully says, then that set of strategies can make it, you know, indeed very you know very very good. At, 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 at handling forces. Now that's not the same thing as the kind of the, the Holocaust level, level uh, force that, that would come from the eye of a tornado. And, and this, 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 is, this can't possibly be the full spectrum of work. There has to be languages of resistance as well and deep, deep underground bunkers and, and stiff things. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of deliberately offering a, an alternate form language, not as a replacement but 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 rather as as something that can be complementary, and if and if we were to extend this kind of argument, then it would be quite important to go into cycles, in in which we would also not only talk about the expansion of a kind of a a condition in which in which things are growing with fertility, but it would also need fallow periods and cutting away and clearing and and you know all the kinds of things that I was just demonizing as being productive forces as well. I mean like we'd, we'd need a much 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 better more complete model to talk about comprehensive viability. So so in what the the rhetoric of this is anticipating that there are some some things that we do as an assumption and and trying to argue for the for the other. So it's not it's not ultimately a responsible, you know, uh, uh, ar argument. It's a, it's a it's a corrective argument, or it 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 assumes those those preconceptions. But I do th I do think that there could be. I th I think th I think we could also argue that the the traditional responses, say, to a flash flood, you know, like like the big the big conduits that run th run through Los Angeles, are really terrible things, you know, because they amplify those forces. They do they they they, they do not dissipate them. And you get remarkable kind of buildups of extremely da dangerous uh, interactions because of the of the, the kind of insensitive use of resistance alone. And so the so the model of, of say a wetland where 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 deep reticulation actually is used, if if you chain things together carefully, so you have, have ro robust robust things and then uh, th things things uh, mounted on those and then things mounted on those, you get 
a remarkable ability of even very apparently fragile things able to handle things very happily. Just in the same way that you think about, like, say, a wedge, you know? I mean, that's a tiny little tip. And yet it's, it's connected progressively to other, to other things. And so that, 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 that suggests that it's absolutely not necessary to use blunderbusses. Hey. Well, I absolutely agree, and, and, and the kind of low-density suburb, you know, that, 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 that populated the, the 1950s, uh, uh, or, or perhaps the, the case study movement in, in California of, of 1930 and 40, is it was a very beautiful vision, but that really was an elite, you know. Um, I mean, th 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 those kind of suburbs are deeply, deeply problematic for, 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 for housing a dense population, and, and the, the kind of, of energy balance that, that they require, you know, the, 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 like the, the, the energy grid that they, that they demand and the transportation grid that they demand, I would, have to, I, I would suggest are, is really irresponsible. I mean, yes, you know, as, as, as a low density people, that kind of balance is a beautiful, beautiful kind of symbi symbiosis. But, but it, it can't possibly sustain a kind of human density that, that, uh, that, that, that characterizes today's world. So, okay, now now we're into political territory. That I say, wow, man, <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, that that those decisions will be made for us. But 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 I, I treading into participating in such decisions is, uh, yeah. <laughs> I think it's an incredibly interesting question, you know, um, and if if safety, you know, is is so acute a, a question, then it's completely understandable that, that that people would would have weapons and armor as a as a as a kind of reflex, and yet. There are very, very different responses that are possible. I mean, I, I, I guess I, I want to think of the kind of behavior and anatomy of a goat, or perhaps a weed. You know, mongrel species that are wily, that are that are that are, you know, whose bodies are full of tendons rather than rather than just, you know, armors. Um, and the the kind of sinewy toughness that, that that can happen that can navigate things and and that's quite willing to, to work with with kind of m mongrel anatomies and, and and hybrids and that that suggests to me that it's entirely possible to work with a tremendous kind of immersion and involvement you know where you navigate and you and you and you negotiate now that doesn't mean doing it blindly I mean you know, you wouldn't go into a swamp without thinking about disease first, or having some some kind of kind of kind of uh, selected equipment. But and it's crucial, in fact, to to have a, a kind of sensitivity and sensitivity and awareness. But it, but it does suggest that there are entirely different responses than those of defensiveness, and fundamentally that 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 human consciousness and 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 human organisms are remarkably adaptive. We can, we can look at plasticity and we can look at adapt adaptation and, f and find very distinct encouragement. It's not simply, you know, a naivety. 
I think, or or a, you know a sense that oh well you you know you can only do that if you know if 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 you you know very temporarily and then your time is marked you know. I I'm I'm pretty impressed with 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 the with the possibility. Uh, it seems important to attempt to build the po the possibilities of vulnerability, at least for the sense of creating the maximum of involvement and reaction with the surroundings, at least for that, you know, as, oppo as opposed to trying to minimize involvement. And I'm afraid we are out of time, so please do give another hand to Phil. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.